Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning from uh, Toronto. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to, to join um, uh, this group here today. And um, uh, I, I think we're going to keep this quite brief. Um, from my understanding is that uh, we want to have a bit of a, a discussion, um, a bit of a Q&A. Um, so we'll, we'll keep this brief. But really, you know, when uh, Dr. Bhandari sort of asked us to, to give a quick uh, talk, um, he said that the discussion would be sort of what are going to be the new uh, frontiers in, in arthroplasty um, uh, research. Um, and so, you know, if you think about clinical practice over the past 10, 20, 30 years, it's evolved. And, uh, you know, in, in a similar sort of fashion, research methods and the study designs um, and the way in which we conduct studies have also changed in the past 20 years. And um, that would suggest that sort of as we move forward, perhaps um, there's going to be a, continue to be an evolution um, in the way we think about trials and and, and how they inform practice. Um, so uh, really what we're going to break down is sort of the, the top five study designs that uh, we believe uh, will um, inform practice um, over the next uh, 10 years or so. And uh, I'm going to, just because we want to keep it brief, I'm going to sort of uh, turn it over to, to Dr. Chaudhry, who's uh, also a colleague from uh, Toronto, and he'll talk about the first few, uh, and then I'll sort of take it from there. Great. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, in, in terms of the, the highest impact research we've seen in the modern research era, uh, and I'm not talking about the case series that have come for the decades and... Did we lose him? Maybe that's my cue to continue then. <laughs> All right, so, so maybe I'll, I'll just uh, to carry on until uh, we get uh, Dr. Chaudhry back here. Um, so once again, this is sort of our uh, subjective list, but um, number five on that list is would be systematic uh, reviews. Um, it's, um, you know, this is a, a study that was done recently, and um, if you look to the right here, it uh, demonstrates that, um, you know, over the past uh decade that the number of systematic reviews that are being published in the literature um, have started have rised uh, considerably and in fact the quality of the, the systematic reviews have improved over time and if you look at the, the hierarchy of evidence um, when systematic reviews and meta-analyses are used appropriately in which they're summarizing the results of randomized controlled trials they can in fact be um, quite powerful uh, research methods and so I think we're going to continue to see a proliferation of systematic reviews, meta-analyses, and the next sort of evolution of meta-analyses, which would are now being um, uh, network meta-analyses. And in the right circumstances, I think this can, these can be informative to practice. Great. Sorry, I just, uh, I don't know, I got kicked off, but that's, that's all right. I, 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 I took over for number five, so you can maybe take, uh, resume here, Harmon. Great. Yeah. So I think large cohort studies are, are your next kind of, uh, you know, frontier in research. Uh, and this is kind of, it gives you a level of granularity that you simply can't get from registry-based data. And that's looking at research prospectively. So, you know, things like harms and exposures where you can't do randomized trials or things like prognostic information. If we're trying to gather information about na natural history of a disease, what happens to a, prosthet a prosthetic joint infection five, 10 years out? Um, and looking at all the different uh, uh, patient outcomes and the details and things that, you know, many of my colleagues that work in databases say are simply not achievable through registries and databases. Um, I think that is another frontier that we're looking at uh, moving forward. And this is, I just put down uh, uh, one of the sub-studies of the enormous uh, trial that uh, Dr. Bhandari uh, led along with uh, many of the centers in India. And this is something that hasn't been done in arthroplasty. Uh, you know, multi-centered, multinational work, uh, looking at prognostic information and the uh, and, uh, gaps in care. So that's another frontier in, in, in research. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, and then there's this uh, um, this sort of uh, uh, idea of real world data, and um, often it's synonymous with um, data that is collected through through registries. And I think arthroplasty in particular is well positioned um, to be informed by real world data. I think in the, the talk prior there was a discussion, obviously, about sort of the, the growth of the, the Indian registry 
um, but also um, existing registries such as the Swedish registry or the Australian registry. Um, and uh, it's not just registries, but I think we've, uh, through sort of technological advancements, we have an increasing number of uh, data repositories to which we have access. Um, here in North America, it's, you see a lot of studies based, uh, published based on insurance databases, uh, quality, um, surgical quality improvement programs, so on and so forth. And um, I think what we've seen a lot in the literature, of course, is trends of sort of what kind of implants are being used, so on and so forth. Um, but what I think has started to recently dominate is advanced statistical approaches to actually have cause and effect um, or develop associations and help us make predictions about which patients are going to do well or which treatments are options. So you, you'll hear things now in the literature quite commonly about things like propensity score analysis or propensity score matching, where the buzzword now is machine learning. Um, and uh, if, if you look at, uh, this is just sort of a, a bit of a, a snapshot of uh, looking at uh, PubMed. So if you just type in propensity analysis, um, you can see this exponential rise in the number of hits you get. Um, around propensity analysis. And of course, if you sort of put in propensity analysis arthroplasty, it follows a similar rise. So I think we're going to continue to see an increasing number of publications that are based on real world data and that are based on sort of some of these, these new techniques that have become almost buzzwords. Um, and once again, machine learning and arthroplasty, same thing. You know, 10 years ago, we saw virtually no publications. Uh, but now that we have access to these databases, um, you're seeing sort of new techniques and new statistical approaches. Uh, and I think sort of especially in India, as this, you know, as mentioned that there's the, uh, the growth and success of this database, this certainly is um, an opportunity to, to publish very informative uh, research. Um, this, I think what we're also going to see um, more commonly is what we call pragmatic and registry-based RCTs. And um, I'm sure everyone's sort of seen this sort of uh, hierarchy of evidence where randomized controlled trials um, sit sort of at the, the top of the hierarchy and then the observational studies, which sort of typically includes registry-based data, um, sit somewhere in the middle. But I would argue that sometimes these uh, hierarchies aren't mutually exclusive. Um, so in a traditional randomized controlled trial, um, you randomize the patients and then each individual center has research coordinators and staff to follow up with patients. Um, but what uh, there's been sort of a, um, a, a recognition that our databases have become better. So perhaps in a new method, we can randomize patients, but rather than using the resources to follow them individually, we can assess their outcomes using registries and databases. Um, and especially in orthopedics, where a lot of the interventions are standard of care interventions, whether we're looking at certain dressings, um, irrigation solutions, um, I think we're well positioned um, to, to, to use and utilize this type of approach to conducting clinical trials. And of course, I think uh, number one, which will sort of always move the needle the most, is the large multi-center uh, randomized control trials. And if, if we're looking at uh, new interventions, um, ones that aren't standard of care, um, as um, you know, been mentioned several times previously, is that the, the most informative trials and, and the most you know, difficult ones to execute are the land, large randomized controlled trials. And uh, here's just sort of a, a quick um, uh, overview of a publication that uh, came out recently, once again, by um, uh, the group at um, uh, McMaster. Um, and where they looked at the number of randomized controlled trials published in, in the journal Boin, Bone and Joint Surgery and from, uh, you know, about uh, 1988 to 2000, and then more recently. And as you can see, that the number of publications has nearly doubled in terms of randomized controlled trials, and also the quality of randomized controlled trials have improved. And uh, therefore, uh, I think we're going to see more randomized controlled trials, um, and I think that because they sort of have better methodology, they should be able to inform practice. So we're, I think we're going to leave it there and then uh, turn it back over to, to Dr. Bendari so we can do a bit of a Q&A.